Hello, my name is John Mern, and today I'll be presenting my PhD dissertation research on Monte Carlo planning and reinforcement learning methods for large-scale sequential decision problems. Sequential decision problems are any problem that, in order to solve it, we need to consider how the action we take now will not only impact our immediate state, but the eventual sequence of actions that we need to take in order to reach some goal. As humans, we solve sequential decision problems almost every day whether they're deliberate sequences of actions like cooking a meal or more reflexive sequences like walking or playing a game. In the machine domain, we've applied formal de sequential decision-making methods to a wide variety of problems, ranging from autonomous vehicle control to resource planning to automated medical diagnosis and testing. A lot of the most recent advances in sequential decision-making, however, have applied here to video games. The reason for this is that many of the most recent advances in automated decision making are very data intensive, and video games are one of the few domains in which large amounts of high fidelity data can be generated cheaply and quickly. The research presented in this thesis will address some of the challenges in scaling up modern decision making techniques from video games to more complex real world problems. Now, in this work, we're going to primarily consider two distinct modes of decision making. The first mode we'll consider is something more akin to what happens when we as humans play chess. When we play chess, we're deliberately planning out a possible sequence of moves. We anticipate how the move we're about to make will likely impact the future state of the evolution of the board, and we reason over the possible trajectories of outcomes that our opponent might take to hopefully arrive at some successful trajectory or sequence of actions. This process is far-sighted, it's deliberate, but it's also time consuming. The upside here is that as we plan during playing a game, we can actively learn new strategies to hopefully succeed in new ways. Conversely, when we play tennis, we don't really think about what we're doing, we just sort of react. It's a reflexive and fast process, but ultimately still results in a sequence of actions that lead us to our goal. The difference here is that we're not actively learning while we're playing tennis, but rather relying on intuition we've built up over time. The analog to chess type planning that we're going to consider in this work are a class of methods called Monte Carlo planning. Monte Carlo planning methods attempt to replicate that deliberate chess type of planning through use of an environment simulator. To understand this, we're going to consider the example problem shown here on our left. In this problem, we have an aircraft in the north that we're going to control by taking actions to hopefully lead to an airstrip somewhere in the south. To use Monte Carlo planning, we'll tell the simulator our current state and an action we would like to consider. That simulator will imagine the effects of taking that action from that state and tell us what our new state is likely to be. In addition to the new state, it'll also give us a reward. This reward is just a signal of how good or bad taking that action from that state was. In our example problem, the reward might be the amount of fuel it took for us to reach that new state. So during a Monte Carlo planning process, we will simulate a full trajectory to some endpoint, and we'll repeat simulating trajectories over and over again until we eventually discover a solution that reaches or nearly reaches our goal. Once we have this successful trajectory in hand, we'll take the first step along the way and we'll repeat the entire search process again for the next action. An important question in designing efficient Monte Carlo search is how do we decide what actions to try from the states that we encounter? What's the best way to explore our action space? The analog to methods that can allow us to learn intuition in the machine decision domain are a class of methods called reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning, unlike Monte Carlo planning, seeks to learn a policy, something that from any state in our entire state space will tell us what action we should take. And we want to learn this entire thing before ever taking a single step in the real world. When we use something called a neural network, basically a really high dimensional function approximator to represent our policy, we refer to this class of methods as deep reinforcement learning. So deep reinforcement learning works in a fairly similar way to Monte Carlo planning. We're going to start by initializing or just setting all of our policy parameters to some random set of values. We're then going to use a simulator as we did before to generate experience. To do that, we're gonna first start off by initializing our state. 
basically picking a random starting state from some point in all the places in the world that we can be in. We'll execute a full trajectory by taking the actions that our policy recommends from the given states that we encounter. And at the end of our trajectory, we'll calculate a return, basically the total sum of discounted rewards experienced along the way. Using this return, we can update the parameters of our neural network policy to hopefully result in a policy that will perform better on our next trial. We'll repeat this loop over and over again from different initial states until we eventually converge on a policy that performs well everywhere. Now, given that we want this policy to be entirely learned before we ever actually enter the real world, a natural question arises of how many samples do we actually need to sample from this whole set of possible starting states to completely represent the state space. We want to be sure that the policy we generate will likely perform well no matter where we try to use it. Both Monte Carlo planning and reinforcement learning are powerful in their generality, meaning that we can use the same set of algorithms to solve a wide variety of problems without feature-specific engineering. This generality, however, comes at a cost, and that cost is data. Both of these types of methods typically require massive amounts of data to adequately solve even simple problems. Let's take, for example, the two problems shown here. To solve brick break on Atari using a popular deep reinforcement learning algorithm called DQN requires 5 million batches of sample data. Similarly, to solve Pac-Man using a Monte Carlo planning method called POMCP requires 50,000 simulations per step. Clearly, if these two simple problems require this much data to solve using state-of-the-art methods, much more work is needed to be done in order to scale up Monte Carlo planning and reinforcement learning to more complex real-world problems. Another challenge that arises when using complex decision-making methods is interpretability. Take, for example, the scene shown here. We're using a neural network agent to play a video game. Even simple neural networks may have large sets of interacting parameters dictating their behavior. And it's infeasible for humans to meaningfully interpret this many complex interacting parameters. In many situations, it's impossible for us to predict what a neural network might do in response to a given input or to explain why it took an action that it took. Now that might be okay in low consequence tasks like video games, but to be able to reasonably apply neural networks and other complex methods to more high consequence tasks like medical diagnosis, more interpretable methods are needed and more trust needs to be built up into these systems by design. Now that we have some background on the current state of sequential decision making, I'm going to outline some of the contributions we're going to present in today's work. The first contribution we'll discuss is in the area of deep reinforcement learning. I'll present a method that allows us to conduct deep reinforcement learning more efficiently on tasks with a lot of different interacting objects. We'll then talk about a contribution in Monte Carlo planning, where I'll present a method to more efficiently explore tasks with a lot of different actions available at every step. Next, I'm going to present contributions that combine deep reinforcement learning and Monte Carlo planning with methods to guide tree search using an offline policy. And the last area of contributions are in analysis and interpretation. Here we have developed methods to represent complex neural network policies as more easily interpretable tree policies. We've also developed bounds on the performance we can expect from Monte Carlo planning methods. During this talk today, we're going to focus on these first three contribution areas. The first contribution we'll discuss is something called exchangeable object reinforcement learning. Before we can discuss exchangeable object reinforcement learning, we need to first understand what exchangeability actually is. And to do so, we're going to consider the example problem shown here. In this problem, we want to control our own ship, the aircraft shown in white, in an airspace crowded with intruder aircraft, shown as the black aircraft 123. We can represent the state of this problem as the relative distances of the intruder aircraft to our own ship, shown as the vector delta 123. Now let's say we've already learned an optimal policy, and we know that in this scenario, the right action to take is the banking maneuver shown here as A star. 
Let's further make another assumption about these intruder aircraft, and let's assume that they're all functionally identical, meaning that not only are the structure of the aircraft themselves the same, but they're operating under the same policy, that in, in any given state, they'll always take the same action. Knowing this, we can recognize that the scenario shown here as scenario one is identical to this new scenario, scenario two, where all we've done is change which aircraft is uh, in which specific position. Aircraft three swapped with aircraft one, with, which swapped with aircraft two. Even though all of the individual aircraft are in different positions, because these aircraft will take the same action from the same state, we can see that the optimal behavior that we should take as our own ship doesn't change. In this context, we would say that aircraft one, two, and three are exchangeable. In fact, we can say that any permutation in the ordering of where we present these aircraft in this relative state vector, delta one, two, three, delta two, three, one, et cetera, are all going to result in the same optimal action. Now, while to us as humans, it might be intuitive that simply changing the tail number or the paint job on intruder aircraft wouldn't change the behavior we could take, unfortunately to a neural network, these are very different states. Mathematically, the vector delta one, two, three doesn't necessarily equal the vector two, three, one. To our learning problem, this essentially means that when we're training our neural network policy, we have to learn to map delta 1, 2, 3 to A star, delta 2, 3, 1 to A star, and every permutation thereof to the same optimal action. Essentially, our neural network has to learn to solve the same scenario many, many times for every possible permutation of those aircraft orderings. So the natural question arises, is there a learning approach that does not require us to actually learn that these objects are exchangeable? Is there some way we could just know it? Some prior approaches have been proposed to do just that. To understand these approaches, we're gonna consider the simple diagram shown here, where we have some set of states X being passed to a neural network policy Pi, which then outputs some action A. The first set of approaches we'll consider are something called object-oriented MDPs. The basic proposal here is that instead of modeling the states of the objects in our environment directly, we instead model the interactions between these objects as the input to our policy. The idea here, the intuition, is basically that by doing this, we can abstract away the identities of the particular objects and only focus on how they impact each other and our own agent in execution of a task. Now, while object-oriented MDPs are helpful, in allowing us to skip learning exchangeability, they're not a generally applicable method and can only be applied directly to a small subset of relevant problems. A second class of methods is something called preconditioning. In these sorts of preconditioning methods, the basic idea here is to, before learning our reinforcement learning problem, to learn a transform F that will change any permutation sensitive input X to a permutation invariant representation y. Essentially, no matter what order we present our objects in our vector x, it'll always output the same y after being passed through the function f. Doing so will allow our policy pi to learn on a permutation invariant space, thereby bypassing the need to learn the exchangeability of the individual objects. Now, while this is again effective in achieving permutation invariance, these types of methods introduce a secondary learning problem, and there's no guarantee that the representation learned Y will actually contain the information necessary about its component objects to solve the problem. Another class of methods attempts to partially address this problem by introducing the permutation invariant transform, now referred to as G, as part of the neural network graph structure itself. By adding G to the neural network, we're able to now learn the parameters of that transform in line with the reinforcement learning problem. However, like the prior class of methods, there's no guarantee that the output of G will retain all the necessary information to best represent a solution to the problem. 
The key idea that we present in this contribution is to encode object exchangeability into the structure of a neural network that's dynamic and able to adapt the information contained in its output relative to what's most important to solving the problem. So like the prior class of methods, we want to introduce a neural network graph, G, as a preconditioning graph before our main policy network, Pi. And we want the output of our graph, G, to be permutation invariant. In addition to permutation invariance, we want G to also be able to do something called importance weighting. Essentially what we mean by this is that we want the output of G to always retain the information about the individual objects in that vector x that are most important to the problem, while those elements, those objects that are less important can have less information represented in that final output. To understand this a little bit more clearly, let's consider again our aircraft collision avoidance problem. We can see in this specific scenario, when we output a, an abstract representation from G, we want to make sure we retain a lot of information about aircraft one as we're about to collide with it. Conversely, aircraft 2, which will probably pass harmlessly behind us no matter what we do, probably doesn't need to have a lot of information retained. The neural network that we propose will be able to importance weight these aircraft and the amount of information retained about them relative to how important they are to solving the problem. To do this, we propose the neural attention mechanism shown here. And we're going to break down what's happening within this mechanism in the next few slides. But from end to end, what's essentially happening is on the left, we're feeding in uh, vectors of each object state represented by those vectors O. And in feeding in those vectors, we're outputting on the right a single state vector SI star. And when we pass in each one of these object vectors, we're going to pass them into two parallel neural network subgraphs. The first subgraph is pi filter. What pi filter is essentially going to learn to do is assign an importance weight to each one of the objects in the total presented set. By passing it through pi filter and then an operation called a softmax, each object is going to have a weight w assigned to it, and all of these weights together will sum to 1. The second network that all of these object vectors will pass through is the pi abstraction network. Now pi abstraction is going to learn a way to transform O to a new vector Z such that each vector Z can be more easily combined into that final output representation S. Essentially what this network is doing is learning to translate the information in a vector O into some new format Z that's more amenable to combination. After we have our set of vectors Z and our weights W, we do a weighted combination of all of them, collapsing them on the object dimension to output that final vector SI star. Now SI star will be invariant to the, any order that we present those O vectors to, meaning that no matter what order that we pass those O vectors through this attention mechanism in, it will always result in the same SI star. In addition to being permutation invariant, SI star is also size invariant, meaning that no matter how many different objects we input into this intention mechanism, the same SI star will always be output, or the same size SI star will always be output. Now let's understand what type of benefits we might expect by using such an intention mechanism. To do so, let's first consider the specialized case of an environment uh, with n discrete possible states arranged from m different objects. Now what we're essentially doing with our attention mechanism is transforming our input space to one that's sensitive from permutations to one that's only sensitive to combinations of objects. Essentially this reduces our effective input size to something that's 1 over m factorial the size of the original input space. To put this in numerical terms, on a task with just five exchangeable objects, the effective input space size of this task using the attention mechanism is just 1% the input space size of the original representation. To test the impact this has on learning, we developed the simple environment shown here. In this task, our scavenger agent, shown as a robot, wants to find a burger. We set this task up so that we could vary the number of burgers present in the environment. In doing so, we can test how effectively reinforcement learning can handle problems with greater and greater numbers of objects, both with and without the attention mechanism present. We also introduced a second variant of this problem, where in addition to burgers, we have poison. 
The objective here is to get a burger while avoiding poison. We introduced this variant of the task so that we can test how well we can implement two parallel attention mechanisms to deal with problems that have two different types of exchangeable objects. We trained each task for a thousand epochs using a reinforcement learning algorithm called Proximal Policy Optimization, or PPO. We showed the results of each one of these trainings, both with the attention mechanism in orange and without the attention mechanism in gray, in addition to the performance of an optimal policy shown as the horizontal line in black. What these results show is that as the number of objects in the environment increases, the relative performance gap between the agent with and without the attention mechanism grows. In fact, as we get above three objects in the environment, baseline PPO without the attention mechanism fails entirely to learn in our 1000 epoch trial. When we repeat the experiment with two different types of objects, food and poison, we see that the pattern repeats itself. Our main takeaway here is that by inductively encoding the notion of exchangeability within the structure of the neural network itself, we were able to effectively reduce the size of the problem presented to reinforcement learning and allow it to scale to problems with many more interacting objects. Our next contribution is something called Bayesian Optimal Monte Carlo Planning. Now this contribution deals with problems that are partially observable. Now up until now we've considered problems that have been fully observable in that we always knew the full state of the world relevant to solving our problem. But as you can imagine, there are many sequential decision problems in which we don't fully know the relevant state of the world. Take, for example, again, an aircraft collision avoidance problem, this time with only two aircraft. Now, let's say in this case, we fully know the state of our aircraft, we know our position, we know our speed, but there's some intruder aircraft that we don't fully know the position of. A common method to, to deal with this in sequential decision making is to use something called a belief. A belief is essentially a probability distribution over all the unknown parts of the state. In this case, we, would, we could set up a belief over the possible positions that this intruder aircraft can be. During execution of our decision-making problem, we might observe the position of that aircraft using noisy measurements like a radar return, and then using these observations and some knowledge that we have about the physics and dynamics of the world, we can update our belief hopefully becoming tighter and closer to the true location of our intruder. We also need to understand Monte Carlo tree search. Monte Carlo tree search is a specific type of Monte Carlo planning that builds a search tree of all of the tra trajectories that it tries along the way, and then uses that tree to decide what to try next. So let's take, for example, uh, a tree search process, starting with a root node. A root node represents our current belief at the time we start our search and it's shown here as a circular node. We'll sample a state from that belief and we'll decide an action that we wanna try, adding that action to the search tree as a square node. Using our simulator, we'll update the state to a new state and get a new observation back. When we reach a leaf node like this, a, a node at the bottom of our tree that we've never visited before, we'll use some method to estimate the value or the expected sum of returns from that state at that uh, leaf node. Using this value estimate, we can update the value estimates of all of the parent nodes along the trajectory we took from that root belief to that leaf node. We'll repeat this process over and over again. Every time we revisit a, a node along the way, we'll add new children to that node. This process will continue for some fixed amount of time or number of simulations. And at the end of the search, we're gonna return the action that has the highest estimated value. Now, Monte Carlo tree search tends to do fairly well on problems that have a small number of actions available at every time step. However, when we have a large action space or action set, Monte Carlo tree search can suffer. To understand why this is, we have to recognize one critical fact, and that's that typically we can expect the quality of the estimates for any given action node in a Monte Carlo search tree to kind of get better the more we visit the node. So if we have a problem that has, let's say, 500 actions available, and we only have a simulation budget of 1,000 simulations, we can expect we're only going to visit one, each of one of those action nodes one or two times. As a result, the expected error on each one of those action nodes might be pretty high and the likelihood that we return an incorrect action recommendation is also high. To partially address this, a method was introduced called progressive widening. 
The basic idea here with progressive widening is to not add all of our action nodes to our search tree at once, and instead to only add them slowly as each action node has time to generate a significant number of samples before the next action node is added. However, unfortunately, when we're adding these action nodes to the tree, they're typically selected at random from our total action set. As a result, there's no guarantee that the optimal action or even a good action will ever be added to the tree. So the question again arises, is there an efficient way that we can explore the different actions available to us to add to the search tree during progressive widening? There have been some prior approaches that help to address this question. The first class of methods we can consider we'll refer to as multi-step search. And the basic idea here is to not search during the tree search process over the complete set of actions, but instead to only consider a sparse or coarsened set of the total action space. Once we've selected an action using this course and set, we can use some secondary optimization procedure to refine that action to selection to something hopefully closer to the optimal action. Now, while these multi-step search methods can be effective, they tend not to be generally applicable and can be very computationally expensive to run. A second class of methods we can refer to as multi-resolution search. Now, the basic idea behind these types of methods is to cluster or group our actions into clusters and then search over these clusters instead of searching over the primitive actions themselves. By searching over the clusters, we can more effectively search over large action spaces using some secondary selection procedure to pick the particular actions from within a group to explore. While these are effective in scaling up Monte Carlo search to larger problems, they don't actually always use all of the information at their disposal to select the right action to take. So the key idea that we propose in this work is to use the preceding searches from our Monte Carlo tree search to inform what actions to next add to the search tree in an optimal way. So what do we mean by optimal? Well, let's consider first what happens in a Monte Carlo tree search. We build our search tree. We generate estimates of action values out of many different action nodes at the root. But then ultimately, we're only going to return the single action that has the highest estimated value. Keeping this in mind, we can define the following as the optimal search target. This quantity, delta QBA star, is positive if the action that we add to our tree is greater than the current best estimated action value and zero otherwise. Now this makes sense because in a tree search, we're only going to, the only time an action added to our search tree will actually change the outcome of the search is if it ultimately has a higher estimated value. The problem with using this as an optimization target is that we don't actually know the function q. Now we can't optimize over a function we don't know. So what we propose is to model a distribution or a belief over q using something called a Gaussian process. Now we can think of a Gaussian process as a distribution over potential functions. We can visualize a Gaussian process for a one-dimensional action space shown in the graph below where we're showing the mean estimated value of that function as the dashed line and one standard deviation bounds as the dotted lines above and below. Now, when we first start out with the Gaussian process with no prior information, it would look something like this, uniform off over our entire space. As we try different actions in our search tree and generate uh, value estimates for each one of these actions, we can use them to condition or update our Gaussian process so it contains more information both about the expected value of actions and a relative uncertainty over those expectations. Using this notion of a belief or distribution over Q, we can define our optimization target as the one that maximizes the expected improvement given this belief. Now we can use the fact that the Gaussian process encodes a Gaussian distribution over the action values to analytically solve for the expected improvement over every point in our action space using the scary looking function shown here. Using this notion of an optimal action, we propose a new type of Monte Carlo tree search called Bayesian Optimal Monte Carlo Planning or BOMCP. Well, BOMCP works in a lot of ways similar to Monte Carlo tree search with action progressive widening. The major difference, however, is that instead of randomly selecting actions to add to our search tree during those progressive widening steps, we're always going to select the action that maximizes that expected improvement given our Gaussian process. 
Now that Gaussian process, we're going to continue to update or condition with the value estimates from all of the actions observed during the tree search up to that point. At the end of search, we're going to similarly return the action that has the highest estimated value, as well as a list of all of our prior experiences that we can then use for future searches. To test the effectiveness of BOMCP, we conducted experiments with three different partially observable problems. A lunar lander, where our objective is to guide a spacecraft to softly land on a moon's surface. A wind farm problem, where our objective is to sequentially place sensors in a potential wind farm in order to maximize the power production of the resulting turbine field. And a cybersecurity problem, where our objective is to take actions to prevent a hacker from accessing some secured server. We compared BOMCP with two other partially observable Monte Carlo tree search methods, POMCPOW and CBTS. For this talk, we're going to focus on the results from the lunar lander experiment. We ran POMCPOW, CBTS, and BOMCP for a varying number of simulations or queries per search. And we can see that for any given number of simulations, BOMCP outperformed both POMCPOW and CBTS. However, this increased performance does come at a cost. Unlike CBTS and BOMCP, POMCPOW doesn't have any secondary optimization or action selection procedure during progressive widening. As a result, it tends to operate much more quickly than the other two methods. However, if we compare the instance where POMCPOW runs with 1,000 simulations per search and BOMCP runs with just 100, we see that despite both of these simulations taking about the same amount of time, BOMCP still significantly outperforms POMCPOW. This suggests it's not just brute force computation leading to higher performance for BOMCP, but that it's actually doing something more intelligent in its action selection procedure. Our main takeaway here is that by using Bayesian optimization, or the method that we used to calculate that expected improvement, we can effectively select actions more efficiently in large-scale action space tree search. In our final contribution, we're going to talk about how to integrate offline policies learned through things like reinforcement learning with online Monte Carlo search. Now, a lot of research in the past few years has focused on just this, how to combine neural network policies with Monte Carlo tree search. To understand why this is, let's understand the strengths and weaknesses of both of these approaches. Offline methods using function approximators like neural networks are powerful in their ability to interpolate. By using function approximation, we can make assumptions about what happens in between the data points observed during training. And as a result, we can generate approximations of some complex function that are pretty good over a very large area. That's shown in the graph on the left. However, if we, however, if we consider a local search, search approach like Monte Carlo tree search, they're powerful in their specificity in that they don't use function approximation and can really well resol uh, can resolve with a lot of detail the values of a function in some small area. The basic idea between combining neural networks and tree search is that we can use the neural network to guide Monte Carlo tree search in some local area and refine the estimates that were produced by that neural network over something like the value function of a problem to get a better estimate in that local area of operations as is shown on the graph on the right. Many past works have integrated neural networks and tree search in one of two ways. The first is through value estimation, by using the offline neural network to provide the value estimates at leaf nodes during tree search. And the second method is by guiding action exploration. Basically, the idea here is that we can use the neural network to bias the tree search process to search amongst actions that it thinks are probably likely better than other actions. In this work, we're going to explore another way that we can use neural networks to improve the performance of Monte Carlo tree search. To understand what we're going to propose, let's again go back to our aircraft collision avoidance problem. Now, let's say we want to use a partially observable tree search to solve this problem at the current situation. So we have our belief and we've already decided our first action to take, shown as the tree on the right. Let's say we take that action and our simulator tells us that we're going to observe that intruder aircraft 100.1 meters away. Okay, fair enough, we, we conduct our backup and we start again. We sample another state from that belief, we decide to take the same action again, and this time our simulator tells us that that intruder aircraft is observed to be 100.2 meters away. Now you and I can intuitively recognize that 
on the scale of aircraft, 0.1 meters is, is pretty close, and in fact, we could probably safely treat these two observations as the same scenario. However, in tree search, because these are generated as different points or different branches, these two uh, observations are going to be treated as entirely different, and any experience or insights we gain by searching down one of the branches is not going to be shared with by uh, the other branch. Now let's say we decide to try that action again. And this time our simulator tells us we're going to observe our intruder aircraft at 50.1 meters away. Now this is significantly different than our previous two observations. However, if it's not time to add a new observation node to our tree, this observation is going to be discarded and its resultant state is going to be clustered with one of the two prior observations. As a result, we're essentially discarding potentially valuable experience needed to solve our problem fully. So the natural question again arises, is there a way that we can share insights between experiences that don't exactly match that also doesn't require us to discard potentially valuable insights that are very different? There are some prior approaches to do this that we can consider. The first is something called alpha vector backup. The basic idea here is to not estimate simply point value estimates at the nodes of our tree, but simple functions approximated by linear functions called alpha vectors at each point of the tree. We can then use these alpha vectors to interpolate for action or state values at points not directly observed in tree search. A second class of methods to consider are something called kernel methods. The idea here is that we can define a function called a kernel that can tell us how different states or actions encountered in the tree are. Unfortunately, the prior proposed kernel methods are limited to specific instances of problems, and in many of these instances, guidance on how to define the kernel is left for expert judgment. The key idea that we're going to propose in this work is to use our baseline or offline learn policy like our neural network as a way to measure the similarity between experiences. So let's go to our aircraft collision avoidance problem one last time. Let's say that at this point we can recognize fully that state one and state two are the same. And because we know these are the same states, we can say that an optimal policy will produce the same output for these states that are the same. Let's say, however, we take state two and we perturb it slightly. We can see that state three, though it's not exactly the same as state one, is pretty close. And as a result, we can probably expect that an optimal policy will produce about the same output for state one as it would state three. Taking this intuition, we can define something called policy space similarity. We're going to visualize this with the diagram shown here. In this, we're feeding in two different states, S1 and S2, into a policy pi. And that policy pi is outputting two corresponding distributions, D1 and D2. Each of these distributions represents a distributions over the actions that a policy would recommend. So in this case, the policy is not recommending a specific action, but a distribution over actions. Using some well-established measures of differences and similarities between distributions, we can establish a similarity score between different states as the similarity between the distributions that its policy produces. So states that result in very similar distributions would have a high similarity score, and states that result in low similarity distributions would have a low score. Using this notion of policy space similarity, we can construct a new type of tree search, which we're going to refer to as policy space tree search. Now, to understand what we're proposing, we're going to consider the example tree shown here, where we have a root node at some state S0 and three previously explored actions, A0, A1, and A2. Now, we're going to focus in on action 0, and we're going to assume that we have already visited action 0 six times. That is, from state 0, we've tried action 0 six times, which resulted in states one, two, three, through six. For each one of these states, we've also generated an estimate of its action value, Q1 through six. Now let's say we try action zero again, and this time we reach a new state, S7. We can calculate the policy space similarity between S7 and each one of the previously visited states, one through six, represented here by the relative size of each one of the particles. We can then use the prior action value estimates of each one of those states and its corresponding similarity score to seven to construct an action value estimate for all the actions originating from state seven that doesn't discard any of the prior observations that we've made. 
In fact, what we're actually doing is estimating the value of these new states from all of our past experiences in a smooth and principled way. Using this new policy space similarity method, we conducted three experiments in three different partially observable problems. One is a light dark problem where we guide an agent to try to find a difficult to observe area of a 1D space. The second problem is a sub hunt environment where we want to guide our agent to hunt down and destroy an enemy submarine. And the final problem is a sensor placement problem where we want to sequentially install radio towers in a noisy RF domain in order to maximize the amount of useful information gathered. We again compared policy space MCTS to POMSI POW for 100, 500, and 1000 simulations per search. And what we found is that in all three tasks, PSMCTS outperformed POMSI POW for any given number of simulations. The main takeaway from this contribution is that there are other ways to use offline learned policies to guide online Monte Carlo tree search, in this case, by helping us to generalize from past experiences. We'll conclude now by summarizing all the contributions we've presented and presenting some recommendations on future work directions. The first thing we presented is a deep reinforcement learning contribution that allows us to more effectively learn over problems with many exchangeable objects. This work was presented at AMOS and the American Controls Conference. Next, we presented contributions from Monte Carlo planning, where we use Bayesian optimization as a way to more effectively prioritize actions for expansion during tree search. BOMCP, as well as another related algorithm, were presented at the AAAI 2021 conference. Finally, we presented contributions in guided tree search, where we use an offline learned policy represented as a neural network to generalize between experiences encountered during Monte Carlo tree search. We're planning to submit this work to Ichikai 2022. Finally, though we didn't present in this, in this talk, we also have contributions in analysis and interpretation. We present methods to represent complex neural network policies as more interpretable tree policies, as well as methods to calculate meaningful bounds on the performance of complex Monte Carlo planning methods. Both of these contribution areas have been submitted to the SAFE AI conference, as well as the Algorithmic Learning Theory Conference in 2022. We have some additional publications that, though related to the work of this thesis, were not directly referenced, shown here. And finally, we want to present some recommendations for future work directions. The first such recommendation is empirical tree search. Now, many of the Monte Carlo tree search methods that we've referenced throughout this work have, have relied on a method of search called UCT, or upper confidence trees. UCT uses a coarse theoretical estimate of search variance in order to guide its search. In our prior work, we found that using empirically based estimates of things like variance can produce much tighter bounds on the actual quantity. Future work should look at how to incorporate empirical bounds such as these to develop more efficient Monte Carlo tree search methods. The second area we'll suggest for future work is in policy improvement search. Now all of the work presented in this thesis has considered the top half of the loop shown here, where we use an offline policy or neural network to guide a Monte Carlo tree search. However, additional prior work has also explored the bottom half of this loop, where you use the results of a Monte Carlo tree search to further train or refine your offline policy. Much of the prior work in this field, however, has relied on existing tree search methods to generate these improvement samples. However, some limited theoretical work has recently shown that you can get greater performance improvement in your neural network by tailoring your tree search process to generate high quality samples. Now this has only been shown for a limited number of cases, and future work sh should look to generalize this type of policy improvement search to a broader set of problems. The final direction we'll recommend for future work is in dynamic planning and learning. Now again, in this work that we presented, the decision of when to use a neural network policy versus when to conduct a Monte Carlo tree search was always treated as given. However, as you can imagine, for many situations, we would like to avoid doing the potentially computationally expensive Monte Carlo search process whenever possible, and to always rely on the reactive, typically cheaper to query neural network policy whenever is prudent. Future work should look at developing meta-control policies that can 
with awareness of the uncertainty of the policy, decide when to trust the neural network versus when to conduct refinement through something like Monte Carlo tree search. And that is the end of my talk. I thank you for your attention. If you have questions about anything I presented here today or anything else in my thesis or related works, please feel free to reach out in the correspondence email provided. Thank you again for your participation.